words that simply say, you are an unceasing spiritual being with an eternal destiny in God's great universe. I wanted to make sure and get the theme before you, so I wrote it on the board, but I see that it kind of faded as it went in this direction, and I, I think that uh, maybe that is what happens in our lives. And uh, so we'll put that in dark ink, and it's here on the front. Uh, the human side of holiness. And that's the theme I want to talk to you about and uh, spend much of our time just going through the scriptures and thinking about experientially what this means. And um, now I, I think the most important thing that is happening here is what's happening in you. And I come with that understanding. Not that I want you to do anything, but I'm counting on the Lord to draw near to you, and I hope that you will give space for that. And uh, as far I, and I welcome you to talk with me as much as you want to. I have a special divine dispensation that allows me to talk with my mouth full of food. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'll extend that to you. And so the eating times are good times to talk. And I hesitate. I don't. I hope you won't hesitate to just let's gather and talk uh, because uh, really the big issue is for each of us individually what is happening to you. I'm looking for that for myself. I certainly have loaded my guns and I'm ready to shoot. Uh, but uh, again, uh, my rule is I prepare like crazy, but I don't trust my preparation. See, it's, what's, it's what God is going to do between us and between you, one another, uh, that, that really does matter. So I hope you will just think of me as one of the group. Think of me as being in the situation you're in because in most respects that matter I am. I'm simply uh, a follower of Christ, walking through the world with other people, learning the kingdom as I go. And so please don't put me in any special category other than just in your fellowship uh, as another one who is a follower of Christ, learning how to do it. And then let's learn as much as we can together. So, um, now, if you're looking at your uh, first topic on your outline, you'll see it says, what does holiness look like shorn of its legalistic expressions? And we're going to be working on that uh, this morning. Uh, and we'll be talking about a lot of different things. And uh, by the way, I do want to emphasize that uh, you don't have to stick with the topics that I have expressed because in, in a part of what I was saying earlier about what happens with each one of us means that you will have questions, uh, you will have issues, you will have topics that are not coming from me. And uh, so we want to make sure that you have opportunity to express those. So now in these sessions, I won't just be rattling on. Uh, I'm mainly looking at you when I'm talking. And uh, so uh, if you have a question or a comment or a problem of some sort, uh, you let me know. And if I need to finish a sentence or a paragraph or something, then I'll say, hang on just a moment. But I want you to be alive to the discussion in these sessions. Is that okay? And I'm not uh, going to preach at you, though I may get excited and break out into preaching occasionally. 
Uh, but mainly, I understand this is in a good sense, an academic context, your students, uh, you're going to be responsible for subject matter. And uh, so I'm approaching it in that way. Uh, just, uh, just do feel free. If you can't get your questions in in the, in the hour, write them down, and we'll get to them somewhere around the building here. Uh, so do keep that in mind. Now, um, this is a pretty good place to start, I think. And I need you to agree with me about that. Have you ever seen this before? This is the assignment. This is the assignment. And it's amazing how long it may take a religious group to get around to this. <laughs> and you may know churches that spend a year or two trying to work out a mission statement. Isn't that strange? Don't you think, really? This is by far the best church growth plan that ever hit the earth. Do you know what it did? Rodney Stark tells us that within 300 years, 50% of the population in all of the cities around the Mediterranean were Christian. There has never been anything like that. Never. And that happened because a small group of insignificant people with no resources whatsoever put that into practice. See, the church has always done best when it had the least. Did you know that? That's still true. But that's because basically they did what this says. And they put their lives on the line and lived here. And I want to say again, there's never been a church growth program that comes even close to this one. Now, I need to get your agreement with things as I go along. And so as we start out, not necessarily just because you're on the spot, but does your, does your heart, does your life agree with this? <coughs> now, be careful because actually this is pretty deep. This is pretty deep. And is what you're investing in as a student at Denver Seminary or as a minister in some capacity. And just as a person, because after all, that's what it all comes down to. If you were in a position of um, a government person in some sort, if you were in a position as uh, someone involved in finance or law, Is that for you? Uh, see, the, this is very important to think about this. It starts with the resources. I have been given say over everything in heaven and earth. That's the guy you work for. Okay? That's why the so, or the therefore, is therefore. And actually, the language here is better translated, as you go. You can check that out. You're all in scholarly mode, and uh, you look at the passage and study it. It's as you go. Therefore, as you go, this is what you're going to be doing. 
So you're going to be going. You don't have any option in life. You have to go. As you go, make apprentices. And I like the word apprentice because it has a strong applied concept to it. Uh, disciple is a good word if it hasn't been washed out as it has in our culture, our religious culture. It doesn't mean much of anything. Uh, an apprentice, that means you're, you're getting hands-on learning on how to do something. Basically, how to live in the kingdom of God. Your whole life. Not just what you do in church. <coughs> not just your religious activities. The discipleship is for the world. That's what discipleship is for. It's not for church. Actually, church is for discipleship. Well, should be. That's one of the things we have to attend to is the divorce in our world of Christian from disciple. You don't have to be a disciple to be a Christian. That's the way it has stacked up. That's, that defines our situation. So that's where we start. As we go, we make disciples. How are we to think about that? Well, again, you know, some of the words of Jesus can be helpful. <laughs> and he said some startling things after talking to a group of people that he pronounced blessed when no one else was pronouncing them blessed. He said, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Let your light so shine before men that they will see your good works and say, God is really good. And that's what will make them become disciples. Because they will hear and see from you the things that will make them say, I really need to know how to do this. This that you are doing. See? Now, of course, there are many dimensions to that. Proclamation or preaching, that's an important part of it. Manifestation of the kingdom, that's an important part of it. And teaching. Proclamation, manifestation, teaching. Where did I get that idea? That's what Jesus did. You study the Gospels, you find out he did three things. He proclaimed. That means you're putting up kingdom announcements. What does it say? Hey guys, here's a new idea. The kingdom of God is accessible to you, where you are. That's the announcement. Matthew 4, 17, repent for the kingdom of the heavens is at hand. Hmm? Now, repent doesn't mean that you get down and beat your head on the floor. You might want to do that after you do what repent means, because repent means just think real clearly about your thinking. <coughs> Metanoeti means get a thought about your thoughts, because your thoughts are what are driving your life. Here's a new thought. There is now the kingdom of God available to you. And it doesn't matter who you are or what's happened to you. It's still available. No qualifications. You just need to say, I'm sick of my kingdom. I'm going into this kingdom. Now we have to talk about the kingdom at length. Because curiously enough, it is the greatest missing element in the gospel today. And one reason why we don't make disciples is because we don't preach a message that makes disciples. So we have to come back to that and spend a great deal of time on it. Make disciples. That's the first thing. Now, there's an order in this. And once you make disciples, you need to gather them. 
in Trinitarian fellowship and reality. You need to gather them. When, when you've got disciples, you bring them together. And that is what becomes church. So ecclesia, a word, it was a word in common use, and Jesus, through his <coughs> disciples, claims that word. And if you now understand about kingdoms, then you understand ecclesia, because ecclesia means you're called out. Disciples are people who are called out. And they're called out of their kingdom primarily, because each person has one. And we must be very clear about that. And then they collude, they get together, and you have a lot of little human kingdoms. And sometimes that grows into something bigger. But that's what you're called out of. Paul's way of putting that in Colossians 1.13 is to say, that you have been delivered from the domain of darkness and translated like you've been in English and now you're in Spanish. Right? You've been translated into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. Do you know Colossians 1.13? Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. And now you want to remember that when you're thinking about the order here. Called into a kingdom, and the church is something that Christ is doing. That's what he said, wasn't it, in Matthew 16? And if you look at the Matthew 16 passage, you'll see very interestingly it's about the kingdom. You remember the keys? The keys? The keys are things you use to get in. That's keys. Now, some of our religious groups have actually translated it into something to keep others out. <coughs> religious monopoly. Oh, you can't get in because I have the keys unless I let you in. But that's not God's idea. God's idea is that the church is built by Jesus. And that's what he's doing now, among other things, is he's building his church. And that's going on right around you and me all the time. Not everyone is responding. Not everyone understands. Not everyone is able to see that God is good because of the people they meet. So there's a lot of confusion. And if I may say so, Satan's main project is to mess up the message. And he works full time at that. You may not have much attendance at church, but you can be sure the devil is there. That's his, that's his main focus, is to mess up the church. And one of the ways he does it is to divert people from apprenticeship to Jesus and getting people, instead of making disciples, to make Baptists. <laughs> Go ye therefore into all the world and make Baptists. Now I can pick on Baptists because I'm a Baptist. So I know some of you are too. So don't worry about it. You could be Presbyterian and get the same treatment. <laughs> He didn't say go make Presbyterians or Catholics. And lo and behold, he didn't even say as you go make Christians. Mm -hmm. Now you may have a little hard time with that, but you need to think about that. Mm -hmm. Christian is a word that occurs three times in the Bible. Compare the times that disciple occurs. And it is disciples who were called Christians. In Antioch, they could no longer think of them as a Jewish sect. So they had to come up with another name. Because now you had Gentiles and Jews and all kinds of people. The cutting edge of the kingdom movement was going on there. And so they, what are we going to call these people? 
Well, little Christ, Christ, Christ people, something of that sort. And so then we got Christian. But then as history goes along, Christian gets divorced from disciple. And one of the things that we really have to think about intensively in this intensive is how we handle that today. What does that mean today? How do people get brought into Christian churches? How, how does that work so that you don't have to be a disciple to be a Christian? We have to think about that. A good bit. Let me just ask, are you all able to hear me on the back row? Okay. If, if it comes to a point to where there's a problem hearing now, you throw a shoe at me, as the man did to President Bush. <laughs> and uh, uh, because there's no point in you not hearing. So please let me know if I'm not speaking well enough or clearly enough uh, for you to hear. But it looks like it's working. Okay. Am I on? Wow. Power. One of my favorite movies is that movie, Bruce Almighty. It's actually very deep, isn't it? You know? I've got the power. So, <laughs> and actually it teaches old Bruce some good lessons, doesn't it? <laughs> okay. So you make disciples and we'll be talking about what... Uh, we'll be talking about um, what a disciple is because we want to be sure and go out of here if we haven't already we want to go out of here with an understanding of what that is because if you're going to make disciples you need to know what one is right and of course you're not going to do very well at making disciples unless you are a disciple so we need to really be clear about that and we'll be coming back to it to spend a lot of time on it now then we're ready for the main thing that I want to talk to you about. And don't go there first, but as you come through those, you run on to lead them into doing everything I've told you to do. Now, I word it that way because it's not talking about teaching them that they ought to do something. You might teach someone that they ought to ride a bicycle, but they couldn't ride a bicycle. Right? You're talking about teaching them in such a way that they actually do the things that he said. Now that's the center focus from my point of view of what it is that we're doing. Uh, you have some objectives of the course here uh, in your handout. Um, and you can look at those, and that will be helpful. Uh, the wording that I'd like to use now for these sessions, here's my ambition. <laughs> that students would see clearly how, on an experiential basis, they can actually approximate in real life to Mark 12, 30 through 31. Now, do you know those verses? Mark 12, 30 through 31. This is the lawyer questioning Jesus about what is the great commandment. You remember that, I'm sure. And Jesus' answer was, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Now, stop a moment and ask yourself, what does that mean to do that? Now, 
order to work that out, we're going to have to talk about your parts. How do you love God with your heart? How do you love God with your body, your strength? How do you do that? What does that mean? So we're going to have to talk about the parts. And then, of course, Jesus added, you should love your neighbors yourself. And we're going to try to see that in connection with this, lead them into doing everything that I have commanded you. Because you don't do that by teaching them to do things. You cannot do that by teaching them to do things. See, that's one of the, one of the curses of serious Christianity through the ages is that it, it has degenerated into legalism. And most of the denominations, if you look at them, you will see that they have taken a few points in Jesus' teaching and put them in terms of actions that people must do and have identified holiness in terms of doing those things. And often it comes out quite comical, like in what kind of clothes you wear. Now, in saying it's comical, I don't want to be nasty. But frankly, a lot of the legalism that people creep into is comical. You think God ever laughs? <laughs> and the things that we might fight over and split on usually fall in the area of legalism. I have never known a church split over thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with mind and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. I want to ask you, have you ever known a church split over that? Now, when I ask a question, I, I seek answers in terms of, because I have to say things that aren't true. And I, so, you know, that's, as James said, you folks who are teachers are in real trouble. You remember that? <laughs> You're bound to say a lot of stuff that's false. Now, if I knew the things I was saying that are false, I wouldn't say them. Uh, but I don't know that in many cases. So you may know of a church split. One side said, we believe and maybe even practice, that you should love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbors yourself. And the other side said, no. <coughs> no. And they said, well, okay, then we can't worship with you. We're just going to go down the road and start another one, or maybe even another denomination. Now, don't you think that's an interesting fact, that we don't split over that sort of thing? Because what that shows is the things we do split over tend to be legalisms. Or even not that, just personal feuds. <laughs> so when we look at that passage now, and, and really everything I'm doing from my point of view, and as far as my intentions are clear to me, Everything I'm doing in these days now is re related to that phrase. Lead them into doing everything I've told you to do. Now, I don't know what will happen because the Lord is running the show. But it's fair that I would tell you what my intentions are. And my intention is to get each of us to a place to where... We could look at a teaching that Jesus has given and say, I know how to teach someone to the point where they would do that. They would do it easily and they would do it routinely because it drops off of them like fruit drops off of a tree 
that's what they do. So what would be a good thing that Jesus said? Well, you can start at various levels because he, his teachings are at various levels. Like the big commandment there in Mark, that's at the top level. And we actually want to think about that because our teaching is, needs to be at the level of the great commandment. How does that relate to praying for those who persecute you and not with gritted teeth? Bless them, Lord. <laughs> How does that relate? So we have to think about the levels of teaching and how we're going to teach people to do things. And so I'm going to spend, uh, spend our time in one, one way or another mainly on that project. Now, I need to ask you, is that something you're ready for? There's some chairs over here and one right there. <laughs> you see, I said something years ago in the, in the Spirit of the Disciplines, I think it's on page 16 or somewhere, <laughs> that I do not know of a single local church or organization that has a plan to do that. <laughs> And now I say it again in the hope that some of you are going to say, yes, here is a church, here is a group that does that. That actually teaches people how to do the things that Jesus says and again, various levels, because sometimes he's talking about anger, and sometimes he's talking about turning the other cheek. See, those are different levels. You see that? If you're an angry person, you're not going to deal with the other cheek stuff. Right? If you get stuck at the other cheek stuff, and you're not thinking about anger, it's not going to work. Right? But have you ever known a local group that taught people how to turn the other cheek. Not that they should. We have lots of that and huge amounts of guilt around it. Like, uh, interestingly, one of the main functions in practice of the Beatitudes is to make people feel guilty. You read them and you just feel, oh, it's so awful. I'm supposed to be poor. I don't want to be poor. I'm supposed to mourn, but that's why I take Advil <laughs> or something stronger. And uh, so people are just, they don't know what to do with it, with the teachings of Jesus. And so this part of the instructions is unfortunately lost. Now I've ask you to do a lot of reading that has bearing on this, but the main thing that I want to make clear to you now, and perhaps it will help you pull together the things that you did in your reading or are doing in your reading, which uh, strikes many people as very strange when they pick up William Law's book on a serious call to a devout and holy life. It gives you a different perspective on things, you know, and changes perhaps the whole approach that one has been taking. Or I ask Howard to have you read Calvin's golden booklet on the spirit Christian life. And it gives you a side of Calvin you may never have heard of. Or Andrew Murray on humility. And 
then I think you've been dragged through a couple of my books tonight. And that uh, can get uh, that can get kind of confusing at the start, especially. But if you understand, the project now is to bring us to the place to where this would look like business as usual, and not something that we have trouble coming to grips with or uh, relating to what we're actually doing in our project or in our life. Is if we can shift that, shift that mental approach to what we're doing as Christians and make that the heart of what, then we have a different world emerging. And you have to imagine what it would be like, for example, where the main membership of our churches and our organizations were comfortable with doing the things that Jesus said out of a life, a heart, a mind, a soul, and so on, that made them routine. What we're looking for is easy, routine obedience. Easy, routine. Routine obedience is the kind of obedience you do without thinking about it. Right. When it's appropriate, it's just there. See, someone who plays the piano, for example, they uh, get a lot of things down to routine obedience. And uh, as a result, they hit the right notes at the right time. That's the outcome of what they have internalized. And that's the nature of human action generally. Unfortunately, it works for sin too. Because what you see in many people is routine, easy sinning. And it's a really great issue for us to come to think, well, that could be shifted so that what was good and right and what Christ has called us to is what we do as easily and routinely as we now sin. Yes, sir. Ma'am. Yes. Sorry. As you were speaking, I, I was back as a child and I kept thinking, this is true. The, you know, Jesus and whatever. Why is everyone so unhappy and not living in the joy and the delight of this truth? And now... I hope we can help sort of answer right, that question. Right. And, yeah. And, but I mean, I even then as a child understood that and, it, and it's been in the next yeah. 50 years that I'm Getting, getting well, that's one of the things that you uh, get when you graduate from Sunday school. So you go to Sunday school and they tell you about the wise man that built his house on the rock. And what did the wise man who built his house on the rock do? Do you remember what he did? And what the foolish man did? The wise man heard him. Obeyed. Heard and obeyed. The foolish man heard and did not obey. Now when you grow up, you learn you can't really obey. It's impossible. Besides, if you did, you'd be proud and go to hell. <laughs> not understanding that one of the things you learn is not to be proud, right? See, the teaching takes care of that little issue. Any other comments at this point or questions? Yes, ma'am. I guess one of the main or passages that makes me feel like it's impossible to get to that point is in Romans 7 where Paul says, I do what I right. don't want to do. And just understanding, like Paul who was so right. advanced and could be content and mm -hmm. all things still had that struggle. And so... So you didn't go on to Romans 8? <laughs> you remember Romans 8? Now there's a systematic body of interpretation of Romans 8 that cuts its tie to Romans 7. Because Romans 8 proceeds to talk about exactly what Romans 7 is about. There is therefore now no condemnation and they read that as forgiveness. 
There's no guilt. Mm -hmm. And those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, for the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now what was Romans 7 complaining about? The law of sin and death. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled, and you interpret that positionally, having to do with forgiveness. So the law is fulfilled in you that in the sense that now the price has been paid for all of your sins. See, the interpretation of that passage that most people have leaves them stuck in Romans 7. And they don't look at Paul's actual life and see that he didn't live in Romans 7. He didn't live there. He's talking about a passage of life in which he found that he could not by his wonderful ideals and principles as a Pharisee and sincere follower of the law, he could not do it. But now, it's really important that you brought this up, dear, because, you know, this is one of the things that sort of hangs over us. And there's a deep truth in it, because you cannot do this in your own strength. You can't do it. It's absolutely impossible. But glory be to God, you don't have to live in your own strength. In fact, you were not even made to do that. You were made to live in the strength of God. See, we needed grace before we sinned. Adam was living by grace. Now, I know that's twisting your categories a bit, I'm afraid, but think, you know, think the thought. If, we hadn't, if man had never sinned, they would have lived by grace. So now you have to get grace over here where it has to do with life and not with failure. The point of grace is not to patch up failures, though it does that. It is to give you the life you were meant for. And that life is seen in Genesis 1.26. You know, the Bible does not begin at Genesis 3. The story is not, it does not begin at the fall. It begins at creation. Okay, now I'll throw out a lot of things like that. You may want to come back and talk about them, or you may want to respond immediately. Uh, but these are really the fundamental issues because in the minds of most people, let me tell you a story <coughs> about renovation of the heart. When it first came out, the people who had to represent the books to the booksellers, the bookstores, could not represent it to them because it suggested it was actually possible not to live a life of defeat And they were so hung up on the idea that that was Romans 7 is the story of the Christian life. Real life story right here in Colorado. <laughs> but you see, it's reflective of this attitude that you're meant to live in defeat. Now, let's once and for all say that we're not talking about perfection in any legalistic terms because you are finite and you live in a world that's going to tear you to pieces at every chance it gets you better not plan on that at least you won't need to worry about it for a while <laughs> so you focus on particular things the things that Jesus taught and learning how to do that and legalistic perfection does not matter anyway because we've already been ruined on that count and that is one thing where grace has to come in and say what, a, what God, in effect, said to Abraham. Abraham, you're a goof up. But you trust me, and I'd rather have that. 
Abraham believed God, and God counted that as righteousness. Now that meant that God resumed his relationship with Abraham on a different basis and a better one. By the way, do you remember what God, what Abraham believed God for? You remember the story well enough. What did Abraham believe God for? Believe God for a baby, a male heir. That's the issue. And it was a big one because this was going to be a miracle. And Abraham's life with Isaac is one of miracle, of trusting God for what was impossible. See, that's what, that's the trust that stands as the basis of your relationship and my relationship to God. That's trust. That's reliance on the kingdom. Now we come to the kingdom through Jesus. We had to talk a lot about that because if you've got kingdom without Jesus, you ain't got the kingdom. And if you've got Jesus without the kingdom, don't worry about whether you've got Jesus. Because the king usually does not come without his kingdom. And so the picture of Jesus as the sacrificial victim alone is not accurate. It's not accurate. That's why the resurrection is so important. And Paul says, you remember in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is not risen, your faith is in vain. You are still in your sins. Now that's a verse that we need to think deeply about because that's what we're talking about, getting out of our sins. If the only issue was Christ's suffering on our behalf to get our guilt taken care of, you will not find any place for the resurrection. It will become an addendum of some sort. But if you understand that redemption includes your life now, and that that comes through your union with the risen Christ and his kingdom, then you can see the broader picture that Paul is talking about. If Christ is not risen, he's not a part of my life. If he's not a part of my life, I can't deal with it. And I am stuck in Romans 7 with all the right beliefs and total inability to deal with life. Okay, how are we doing here with this? Are we all in agreement this is a good thing to do? Uh, would you think that if I could teach someone to do what Jesus said, it would be a good thing for me to do? Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering that there's a lot of talk about what is the gospel. Yes, there is. And I'm going to afflict you with a bit of that. <laughs> but please go ahead. No, that's the, cru that's the crucial question. Well, you're, when you mentioned 1 Corinthians 15, it just, right. I was just reflecting on, you know, is, and that's the question, you know, is, what is the gospel? Is this the gospel? Is, you know, well, the gospel isn't up here. But if you will look at, this is what comes out of the gospel. If you decide to make disciples, you're going to need to have a gospel on the basis of which disciples are made. The major question for all of us as we think about what we hear and what we do is, does the gospel I preach have a natural tendency to produce disciples? Does the gospel I preach have a natural tendency to produce disciples or only consumers of religious goods and services? And then you as ministers, you supply those goods and services. Or does it actually light people up so they go off like a rocket? My definition of a missional church is one that you can't stop from growing. That's a missional church. It's not one that sort of one day wakes up and shakes itself and says, hmm, we should have some missions. 
Now, some churches need to do that. <laughs> I concede that. And it's not an altogether bad point to make. But probably if they were not already on a mission, there's something deeper that needs to be dealt with. So now I'm planning uh, after the break to go into more of that. But I want to just conclude this session uh, by a final remark about this issue of legalism. And I put it to you in this way. Suppose you learn that Clarence Brown is a holy man. What would you expect him to be like today? Now, there's two ways of thinking of that question. One is to be alert and think about it in a normative sense. And you might say, well, I would expect him to be Christ-like. And then you need to spell that out some. But there is another sense which is operational, and that will be in terms of particular practices and particular things that people say. No, here's a, here's a real tough one. Don't get mad at me, please. In order to be a holy person, are there certain things you have to say about the Bible? Would you think that Clarence here holds a certain view of scriptural inspiration as a condition of holiness? What about social justice? It's a big topic today, isn't it? An important topic, a very important one. Unfortunately, it's very badly focused on symptoms and not on causes. Poverty is a symptom. What are the causes? How do you trace that through the educational system and to the church? The causes we're talking about. So we're going to talk about being holy We need to redo it in terms that are meaningful for us today. And many of the issues that come out of holiness or unholiness are deeply important. The nature of the family, relationships between men and women, ecclesiastical authority, all sorts of issues that get in the news now. They're very deeply important. But I hope you're going to start thinking about holiness at a deeper level that might be expressed in many, many passages in the Bible. Just the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, kindness, meekness, faithfulness, self-control. What do those mean? in the category of holiness. If you knew someone had the right view of scriptural inspiration, would you be prepared to make any inference at all to the fruit of the Spirit? Or have you have perhaps known people who had the right views of social issues, scriptural inspiration, whatever you want to talk, and were just as mean as a snake? You may have known someone like that. So maybe you can think or jot down a few things at two levels. What might be expected as marks of holiness in your environment today? As marks of holiness. And then perhaps if you list two or three things, then some reflection on, is that adequate? Is that what we need? Is that what we want? What is a deeper look at holiness? How does it look today?
and uh, kind of keep that in the air uh, because holiness is very important, is it not? Uh, is it? Actually, an old guy said that no one without holiness shall see the Lord. And that's probably a good thing because if you're without holiness and you actually see the Lord, it'll probably blow your fuses. <laughs> but holiness has slipped out of our vocabulary along with discipleship partially because we are still bouncing off of a legalistic conception of holiness. Not as prominent now, especially in, in the same form, like uh, in the north when I was young, in the northern part of the United States, you could not smoke and be holy. In the south, you go in front of a church between Sunday school and the worship service, you'd think burnt offerings were being offered up. Right? <laughs> but when you smelled it, you knew it wasn't. <laughs> Holiness. Right? My wife and I, when we were married, we went on our honeymoon to a place in northern Georgia, a retreat, Christian retreat, Lake Louise. And uh, we went swimming in the lake. And someone came down and rather gently said, no mixed bathing. And uh, well, we told him we were married, and then it was okay. Apparently, you can, that's mixed, okay. Um, well, what kind of an issue is that? See, those are ritualistic marks of what is proper and right and holy. Holy people do not do mixed bathing. What in our world today, what in your world, as a mark of holiness falls in that category. Yeah. It's very important for us to think about those things if we're going to do right by the call to holiness with which you can see God. <laughs>